te tūtahi te mihi karanga ki a koe mō tēnā mahi te whakawā te o tātou hui i tata nei. Huri nō ki a kōtou o tēnei i a rohi o rangi tāne, ki o kōtou maunga wāhi tapu wai marino. Mērā me o tēnei i a wāhi a tēnā kōtou, ki a kōtou ngā hoa mahi hou, hoa mahi tāwhito hoa mai nei a tēnā kōtou. Huri nō ki tēnei tangata hoki, a tahu ranga tira mō tēnā mahi, tēnā mahi āhua ki tahu upoko, me tāna hoa ranga tira ki te taha, a tēnā hōra, a tēnā hōra, a nō mahara mai ki tēnei o ngā mahi a tū mō mō pāna ke ngā atua ngā kaiti aki me ngā tupua hoki. Huri nō ki tēnei tangata koko nei hoki a mau ngā mō tō tautoko ki tēnei a tēnā koe, a tēnā koe, a nō mahara mai e hoa, pai tō āhua. Well, bloody too late, I finished. <laughs> now, like um, my mate here, um, Anaru, uh, my connections to this place have been uh, over a number of years. And I always enjoy coming back here. This is probably one of the most beautiful campuses of all the uh, Mananga across the Motu. You've got all those bush areas down there. People are always welcoming here, um, and they listen to some of my dopey ideas, so it's a good place to come to. Uh, it's never a trial. I'm humbled that uh, people would invite me back. Usually I only get invited once, uh, and then it's into taking care of all the problems after that that I've caused, so this fella doesn't know any better. Uh, and Mohan over here, who helped arrange part of my visit to this place, it's the first time he's ever met me, so he doesn't know either. <laughs> uh, having said that, I'm a bit disappointed that I didn't get any security like Tame Iti did. <laughs> but must be that my talk is crap. And sometimes I get nervous when people clap at the start of your corridor because you don't even know what I'm going to say yet. <laughs> However... This fella said to me, I uh, hope you have a few contentious things that you want to talk about. I said, I have none of those. None of what I have to say is confrontational at all. Um, but some people see it that way. I certainly don't. But I know that Mohan's quite keen to see whether I can ruffle the feathers of a few of the different institutes and organisations globally and maybe within this country as well. I um, also acknowledged um, our rangatira over here, Mark Hopua. Um, I met Mark a number of years ago, and actually it's his people that caused this change in me. So I'm humbled that he's here. Um, I know it's because there was some other job like cleaning the toilets, and this was the better option. <laughs> but uh, he come to have a listen, which is an uh, honour to me and maybe to the knowledge here. We'll see at the end. Uh, in, gee, it must have been about 06. I'd been working in the Middle East. I came back for a quick visit. And I was in Gisborne and I met Paratene Ngata. And uh, a lot of you will know the Ngata whānau. And one of them turns up on the $50 bill, I think. We don't see any of those, but you know who I'm talking <laughs> about. And uh, Paratene, I could hear him before I saw him. You know that high-pitched laugh he used to have? And uh, I knew there was a fella having a good time in the area of the seminar room doing a presentation. It stuck my head in. He called me in, and then after I'd done my presentation, he said to me, you need to come and live in Uawa, in Tolaga. And I was living in Riyadh at the time, and there were 10 million people. And I said, I don't know how you get your head around this paratene. You want me to live where there's six dogs, eight people, and 10 horses, <laughs> instead of where I'm working at the moment, with you know, this uh, big kind of initiatives that we're up to. He said, that's dead right. And it was the best move I ever made, hands down. Going living with the... Uh, uh, initially, I said with the Ngāti, but actually they the Aitanga Hauiti over there, the Hoetians, going to stay with the Hoetians who identify themselves a bit differently from the Ngātis over there. Uh, for a lot of my mates, they saw that as career suicide. They said, what the hell are you up to? Why would you go there? I learnt more there in the three years I was there than in the previous 25. What they did to me was that uh, I work in health promotion. I lectured at Otago University for quite a few years in phys ed school. Um, come in, come in. And uh, I'd always thought that health was about trying to get fellas as skinny and as fast as you could. 
and that's what I'd seen all the magazines. I turned up in Tai Tanga Hoti and said, this is what we're after. And they looked at me and said, mm, I don't think so. I've got a funny story. You'll, you'll appreciate this one because you'll know who it was. But one of Wayne's sisters, not long after I got there, I convinced them to try a few things. Wayne Ngata, that is, Paratene's brother. Um, and I got them to do all sorts of crazy things in the early days. And I said, we're going to do a yoga session down by the river. And they looked at me like, oh, no, bugger that. Because <laughs> I convinced them to start running their local maunga. And it was the Hundi Club. They called it the Hundi Club. If you're over 100 kilos, you could come. So the Hundley Club, I convinced them to go and have a yoga session. And I said, OK, we're going to touch the ground. And you're going to bend over. And I want you to look between your knees and look out towards the river. Wayne's sister says to me, Era, there's no fucking gap between my legs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to swear in the public. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> they hard case crew. And they tested me the whole time. And one of the things they did was I started running them up the manga. And each day we went, it was a different reason for being there. Some of it was physical. Some of it was about psychological shift that we wanted mental toughness days where we'd run them up the fence line. Other days was our way to it. And up there, as uh, Mark knows, there's a number of sites where their people were set up, where they had kumara places, where they had a whole range of different connections. And we'd run to those and lie down next to them and have a talk. And that was it for the day. Sometimes there was only a 10-minute run. So it shifted back and forwards between a whole range of things. And it was the fellas from Hawati that caused that. Uh, and now it's in the space of where I travel and talk to people uh, in different spaces globally about uh, population health, te waiora o tāne, as opposed to hauora or oranga, they being more contemporary concepts and terms. And really it was the fellas in... Uh, Uwawa and Hawati that challenged my way of thinking and knowing and shifted it. So I'm a consequence of that place. Having said that, I don't think they want to claim me. <laughs> and uh, every now and then, fellas say, oh, poro this and poro that to me. I said, I'm from Waikato Tainui. I'm from a different place. Um, but they looked after me beautifully there. And one of the things Paratene said to me when I first arrived, I said, oh, I'm a keen diver. I want to go and get a fee. He said, you won't have to dive anymore. The prey fish walk up onto your back doorstep. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. And sure enough, to his word, people dropped them off. And I could go for weeks without having to go to the shop because there would be corn, there'd be potatoes, there'd be seafood galore. Venison, all of it was dropped off. So you can't ask for more than that. The other thing they used to do, too, was they knew who my daughters were. And if my daughters were walking around the street, they'd pick them up and bring them home. Uh, and you can't pay enough for that in any community you live in. Some of the bigger places, those are the things you wish for. In that place, it's still... How it rolls. So I was lucky. Now, one of the things that Paratene said to me at the time was, I want you to do three things. And this is as he was dying. Uh, when I got there, I was only there for maybe four or five months, and, um, and he was on his way out. Uh, I got marched into, I, I'm sure you would have too, that you had to go into his room and got to talk to him about what your job was. I got the Okay, come and sit there, boy. This is what you're going to do from Paratini while he's on his deathbed and died two days later. Um, I don't think that came into the employment contract now that I think about it. <laughs> and it's hard to argue with a dead fella. You can't go to negotiation or anything. But <laughs> he sat me down. He says, you've got three things that I want you to do. One of them is to get the coast moving, get them active again. The second thing he said to me is, I want you to talk to other iwi about ways of promoting health. And the third thing I want you to do is talk to other tangata whenua across the globe about what happened from here, what, what came out of Hawati and why it started. I said, I can maybe get to the first thing, but I definitely can't do the last two. I don't think they have time for clout, Paratene. But um, it's exactly what I'm doing. And Paratene called that one, and I've been pushing that. And it's been my obligation to knowledge, but partly to that fellow as well, because uh, he put some trust in me at the time. Not well founded, to be honest. <laughs> but he did. And uh, I think Ngati Poro probably regret the day he invited me in. But there's been a thing, few things that have fallen out of that. One of them was Kiorahi. Uh, some of you will know that game. Uh, that kicked off with the uh, Pa Wars in Uawa. Now, I'd been teaching that since 2000, and nobody was interested. It was almost 20 years of Kiorahi. When I got to Uawa, they said, can you teach anything about health in our power wars? I said, 
like a teacher fellow's kiorake. Uh, so we played it there, and they said to me afterwards it was the first time they've ever had an ambulance on the field because they were trying to kill each other. <laughs> and they said, I don't know about the good part of that, but people were into it. And within a year, they had tournaments of 500 kids turning up. So the kiorake that spread through the moti, through the country, really, it kicked off in Tuawa with the first pa wars. So I, as some of you do as well, owe um, Tuawa quite a bit. I never failed to talk about those fellas too at the beginning of any of my seminars because uh, it was Parakene that made me uh, rethink what it was I was doing. So today I'm going to have a bit of a talk to you about some of the places we've been, what we're doing with health promotion, and some of the ideas. I'm pretty uh, relaxed as you can see with the uh, presentation style. If you want to ask a question and you're bursting, ask Mark. <laughs> Part of the other reason that I come along to talk to you today too is because of this fellow here. Um, one of my relations, I'm a heke. Uh, I'm from Waikato, but because of uh, some of the different battles that occurred up by Ngāpuhi, uh, Waikato travelled up there, some of them came back. Uh, whenever I moved through the Northland area there, uh, and they know that I'm a heke, a couple of things happen actually. Usually the first one is I was in prison with a heke. The other one is I just divorced a heke. <laughs> but never, uh, or uh, are you related to some of the hekes that are doing good things? It's always the other. Oh, I'll tell you the other one I got was Tariana, Tariana Turia. First time I met her, <laughs> she was funny. She said, oh, you're a heke. I said, yes, yes. She said, I know a heke in Whanganu. I said, I know you do. She said, and is he still with the Black Power? Yes, he's still the president. <laughs> she says he's a bit naughty, but he does do some good things for the community. Now, that uncle of mine, um, his name is Elvis. That's probably why all the fight started. But he's uh, working in a health initiative in Tamaki, and he's taking kids out fishing and teaching them about the ocean. I like to think that part of it was because of this fellow here and the uh, things that he pushed some of the heke whanau towards. Uh, being disruptive thinkers, about countering the way that things might have been done in the past and suggesting some alternatives. And I'm definitely in that space of when I see things now, I don't see the same picture that a lot of my colleagues do. I don't read and have the same karufa or, or glasses or headphones on that a lot of my contemporaries do. I see things in a different way. In the space that I work around environmental science, the way Orotane, uh, health, population health, a lot of the things we've been doing haven't been successful. And for the life of me, I can't understand why you keep doing the same thing and expect a different outcome. So if nothing else, I've been challenging those for the last decade. I'm trying to push things into another space. You fellas doing all right? Can handle so far? Sure? Like all of you here, you fellas must have to clean the toilet too. <laughs> so I'll carry on. We'll jam through a few ideas here. Uh, my daughters uh, like the idea that we're related to this fellow too. Actually, uh, two of my older daughters, they write music and they perform and do that kind of thing. One of them just finished writing a song about this fellow. Whenever we're overseas, we um, sing about some of the stories and events that this fellow got involved with. I was in Ireland two years ago and they wanted to hear stories about the English and Māori. And I told them one of the stories. I'll get to the point soon. I'll actually give you some of the slides, but... Uh, it was a hard case situation because we were at an Irish radio station where they only spoke Gaelic and they said you can't speak English in here through a translator to us as Māori. They said you can't speak Māori. So they were speaking Gaelic, we were speaking Māori and we had to have two translators to talk with each other that would explain what we were saying. It was the craziest thing and they said have you got any stories about the English? There was a few swear words in front of the word English but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got one or two. This fella here, a uh, famous, well-known story of laying down a korowe, um made from kiwi feathers and putting a, a, a mere, a mere poudnambu in the middle of it. It's the two of the most precious assets of our people. Laid them down on the ground. Then he squatted over them and crapped on both. Then he wrapped that up and he sent it to Kawuti, who was one of the other rangatira in that Ngāpuhi area. When it arrived, 
uh, a lot of the lieutenants of Kabuti were really angry at that act. They said, uh, it's time for that fellow's head to come off. He was young, cheeky, and out of control. Kawiti was the senior statesman, and he knew what it meant. That, that was a tohi. It was a metaphor, huhua tau, that said, this is what the English have done to us. The English have shed all over us, and it's time to go to war. So it was a declaration of war. The Irish radio announcer almost fell off his chair and how much he loved this. He says, oh, that's fucking great. <laughs> I fucking love it. Oh, fuck, I spoke English, he says. <laughs> so he was pretty funny. Uh, and <laughs> especially about some of the things that these fellas got up to. So uh, these are some of the ideas and reasons and drivers, maybe. I don't know whether they are for me, but some of the potential recipients of ideas about changing population health and contributions of indigenous people globally is to try and address some of these issues around what they're calling wicked problems. Wicked problems, as most of you will know, are real complex issues that have multiple factors that are hard to determine what the outcomes are going to be because of the way that they move and change so quickly. Our obesity, climate change, global health, they're all in that space because the factors that change the outcomes are so many. They're so convoluted in the way they cause things to come out the other side, it's hard to predict. In that space of climate change, just recently we finished writing a little article, well, it's not so little, cool, it's a little bit mine where there's a small part in it, but the Lancet Commission uh, policy in there that we wrote a paper on that was looking at the global syndemic of obesity under nutrition climate change. So big topics to talk about. number of countries involved in it and I wrote a piece in there about Maori approaches to health are quite unique but a number of our people don't know what those are anymore and haven't seen them for quite a while. Now uh, Mark's um, behind the over here mentioned just briefly just for a moment there when we were discussing before um, our hui. And it's something that I firmly believe in and something that we promote, that health has nothing to do with people. Health is a consequence of the environment that causes that as an incidental outcome. And once you understand that shift away from people and understand that it's the environments that we're part of that might cause what you see to be expressed in people, that allows us to move forward because the time frames of how much effort people will put into trying to make changes is too small. A 30-year space, if that, and that's someone that's hard out into it. More likely 15. And then we get smashed quite often because of the political system that's only maybe there for three years, and then even less because there's probably only 18 months where a government will work with us to make change. Because half of that time they're trying to secure their position, the other time they're after votes again, so you see it goes from 30 down to 18 months really quickly. So we're in a tough position of how we can make change in that, especially if we stay human-centered. So we promote the idea that it has to be about the pursuit of environmental knowledge first. And for us as Māori, and potentially for other indigenous people globally, that means looking at traditional environmental knowledge as the overarching philosophy for why we might change. You with me here? You sure? I saw you sit up and go, hang on a minute. <laughs> you see people change with that one because when you say health has nothing to do with humans, they're like, well, who the bloody hell has it got to do with that? It's to understand tayau and what environment cause in us and how we express those is the critical factor. So, it means that things like going to the ocean, getting in the ocean multiple times will have the incidental outcome of shifting your health, but really what you're after is the knowledge of how a wave is produced by kiwa, or mohi, or koto, or tangaroa, kinimwana. All of those representatives of those places have bodies of knowledge that are particular to them, and we're trying to encourage people to go after knowledge first. And if you do that, everything else comes with it. When we stay human-centered, when we stay based in or embedded in these ideas of wicked problems, we get consumed. We run out of energy. 
plus as Maori within institutes like this especially, we're a minority and we already get hammered with a heap of other things. This gives us a chance to emphasize the things that make us who we are and maybe share that with our colleagues. Maybe share that with other tangata whenua from all over the, 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 uh, the whole of the planet. You still with me? So, Mātauranga Māori is at the top. The next level down from that is Whakapapa. Now, this is another concept that I've been working with some of my mates on to look at the effect of Whakapapa. Now, Whakapapa has been used in ways that I don't know that it was intended to be used. And the term has probably been misappropriated just like Atua has. Now, when I'm talking about Mātauranga Māori and I'm talking about those fellas that have uh, pockets of knowledge in their particular domain, about water or about land or about Ngāwhetu, those fellows that are in those domains and understand those areas, that's in the Atua space. When we drop down to the next level of Whakapapa, what I've seen happen in the past is that people think Whakapapa is a list of names. Would you agree with me here? Or genealogy. List of names? More of you got to nod your head or I think I'm talking crap. In mainstream, that's usually what whakapapa means, or genealogical line. To me, uh, and this one causes some people some <coughs> trouble too, the names don't matter. I know a lot of you are like, oh, 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 hang on a minute here. You're talking about my grandparents. Mean as their choice, they did all these cool things to get you here today, which means that you had to be the vessel to carry the best of all of your people. And I'm not just talking Maori here. Anybody that's here, your parents chose the right things. They selected the attributes that were going to help you survive, which is why you're here. Whether you're bloody Indian, Maori, Parker, doesn't matter. Your family did that for you. <laughs> right? You're still with me there. So that means that you're the best we're ever going to see until something else changes. Now, why I'm saying this is that when we have lists of whakapapa, the names don't matter, the line does because it's the line that caused something to change. See what I'm saying here? We've got to study the line or the causal connection between Atua, the causal connection between people, between Atua and people, to understand why something shifted. And at the moment, I get a lot of people want it. You do too, I bet. Can you give me a list of all the Atua names is what I get a lot. Tell me those, all of the names. I'll take the list away. And I says, I can, but it doesn't mean anything because you have to know which Atua affected change in another Atua. And they talk about the kuare tanga of atua, that they only know their own domain anyway. They're ignorant of what other atua are up to. But I've found that atua, uh, it's difficult to discuss one atua without discussing all the other 150, 160 of those atua. They don't exist in isolation, and nor do we. Which means if we're going to look at population health and use this for a model, we've got to understand the whole range of those atua. So... We move from Mātauranga Māori, or knowledge around Atua, maybe environmental science, and down into Whakapapa. And Whakapapa is something that we do. It's not something that we read. And that's a fundamental shift that fellas are struggling with at the moment because Whakapapa is something that we enact every day. And the way we do that is to learn, to push ourselves physically, to make stronger connections to Tayo, to understand other people. That is the effect of whakapapa is that you grow it and you make it stronger. It's not a list. It's a noun. It's a doing thing, not a reading thing. A verb, is that right? Is that the yeah, yeah, I always crack at that. <laughs> so climate change is in that space. One of those wicked problems, and what we've been looking at lately is because of the issues around consumerism, neoliberal thinking, capitalism, People are driving hard towards showing their success as part of society by consuming as much crap, really, or things as, and gathering as many assets to themselves as they can as possible to show their success. What was real interesting to me in this space here is in the last 20 years, we've seen the uh, consumption of proteins go from something like 22 kilos to 46 kilos per person per year. Not because they're hungrier because they want to prove how, they, how good they are at being a capitalist or being a consumer or showing the rest of society, I'm doing all right. And the way I'll show you is I'll buy more expensive things. Now, you all know this, that uh, in a 
or which order to put this in, but Gandhi followed some of the people from Taranaki in the pursuit of passive resistance. But we've got quite a few things we can also learn from that fellow. And he, he often used to say the idea that it's not a sign of good health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Was it him that said that? Maybe I'm making that up. Sounds cool though. <laughs> and I think that's where we're at at the moment is we're trying to adjust to other people in our society and be consumers when maybe that's not the ideal. And it certainly wasn't a process that Māori engaged in. We looked after the whole area. And I think what we'll see is some shifts towards that pretty soon. Everybody still okay? I better hurry up. Did I tell you that that presentation last week that uh, there was an Australian woman went before me and she had 170 slides? I know. <laughs> I think I got to about eight and, and I was like, oh, bro, is this going to take long? She had a 45-minute slot and she took an hour 25, which I thought was rude. I wasn't even on next, but it was still stink to do that to the next fellow that came after her. He was cool too, and this fellow, he was uh, Australian youth as well. Say fucker papa back to here. I don't know that the Australians like that, but because they'd claimed them. It's 170 slides, so today you've got four. Because I don't know about the idea of 170, maybe five. We'll have a look. I'm not going to say I wrote this this morning 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Because Andrew said to me about, you know, slides are pretty cool. So, okay. I'll just talk to you a bit about sustainability. One of the things, too, that's happening for Tangata Whenua from all over the globe is that if you want recruitment and sustainability, then we're coming down through Mātaranga Māori. So there's the first point. There has to be knowledge that connects to them for them to be interested in sustaining effort in that space. It has to be whakapapa. So there's a contextual relevance. The next level down from that is the hua hua tau, which is what am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to know from going to that environment? What am I meant to learn from those atua, kaitiaki or tipua? And in this area of sustainability, if you want sustained effort from any of the fellows that you might be doing research with, it has to be relevant to them. Now this is going to piss a few of you fellows off as well. What I've been noticing over the last, and I was part of this process too, around research with Kopapa Māori, uh, I think that time's finished. I think we've transitioned into another space that's moved from Kopapa Māori into iwi-centred versions of that. Don't get me wrong, I love Kopapa Māori, but people in districts I'm working with want to know what their version is. And Kopapa Māori was critical for access 25 years earlier but what I'm seeing from our community demanding of me is, me and as, I'm not from down Tahu. I'm not from Tupere. What's our version look like? So it's shifting into iwi-centered versions of health, which means if I want to have that group sustain effort, it has to be a different health promotion program from fellas directly across the border, which means I can't use a kaupapa Māori approach. It has to be iwi-centered, and it's going to change again in five years. Absolutely. Mohan, wake up. I'm not that bloody boring. <laughs> Don't think I didn't catch you yawning in my interview yesterday either. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> so, it's going to shift into hapu politics pretty soon too, I would say. Uh, and no disrespect to some of my r relations in here that look at me like, bloody hell, how dare you say that about Kopapa Māori? I love Mason Jury. That fella marked my PhD. I love Russell Bishop's work because he's from Wakato. All of those fellas, the Smiths, Graham and Linda, oh, they're up here. Those are people that I followed and revered, and here I am talking about some of those things. But I would hope that they would want the best for Māori health and to see it transition into another space. Oi? Don't bloody hate me. <laughs> Just the messenger. The maungaiki tēnā. So, some of the... Actually, that's crap. I'm copping out, really. I'll own it. So, the other thing we're going to see soon too is a shift into seasonally based physical activity. We see that a little bit now, but it's going to be... And now I'm talking from health promotion perspective here. So, when I talk to you about Mātaranga Māori, whakapapa's under that, hua hua tau. Uh, and I could send you the slides and I can give you the frameworks for these if they are a bit confusing in terms of, you know, the metaphors for what we're learning. The next level down is the whakatina natanga, or the action space. And a lot of health promotion followers I work with get stuck here. 
in the whakatina and the tanga space of doing the do. But unless you can provide a rationale for why you're doing the do, the likelihood of recruitment and sustainability to that is bugger all. Because they don't know why they're there. And the why, and this one's hard out again, can't be health. That can't be physical activity. If you use those two as the reasons for why they should come and be a part of your program, not going to last. This is 35 years standing in front of you, trying that and failing for 25. But in the last 10, it started to shift. And part of it is because I've changed the approach that I take and say, we've got to understand the knowledge in those environments. And that causes physical activity, causes health, causes all those things after. Boy? So, why that's of importance, mātanga māori, whakapapa huhua, tau whakatina na tanga, we're now shifting into the when. These are the why, who, which, what. We're shifting into the when over here, which is mostly about maramataka, of when things are shifting, and we've got to make viriata mākeha. You know this? Uncle? Yeah. And viriata is doing a lot of work in maramataka, and it's beautiful stuff. Unbelievable. Some of the things he's rolling out will blow your mind. You can predict almost to the hour of when a plant will flower this forest. There's webcams all through Auckland out on different islands that he monitors for when things shift. There's one day during the month when rats come out during the day and he's caught pictures of that. There's one day per month where whātiki or flounder will come to the surface and come out to beside the beach. He doesn't want to know. Don't want to tell you the day for that one. <laughs> I'm not sure why. But he didn't want to share that part other than that happens. But he showed me some pictures and some videos of that. There's things that happen within each month, and this is another area of work. These fellas work with more than me. But he's been looking at the last 10 years of coroner's reports from Northland, and youth suicide is pretty much consistently within three or four days of each month. And those are low energy days according to the Maramataka rotation. I don't know that that can be coincidental. And I don't know that it's supported by mainstream positivist reductionist science, but it's certainly something that we're seeing. And that opportunity to share that with other people globally is massive. Imagine the potential for sharing that information and reducing youth suicide. So that's the win phase around Maramataka that slides down under there. There's an, a second area that I'm working in more so is um, tohunga tanga, which is looking at which tohu from Taiyao, from the environment, tell us something's going to change. So while maramataka is sometimes connected to kopeka, these are two of seasonal shifts, and then to maramataka, tohunga tanga is only three or four day shifts. And in here what I teach is that there's five sets of tohu spaces that we can look at. And our, our ability to read trees our ability to read fish, our ability to read insects, birds, and star movements. Those are our five areas of tohu. And so I teach kids these now, and I'll go into kura, I'll work with them about how to read those. Now there's specific names, for example, for winds that affect totara tree, hauto. But when that wind affects that tree, and we tell that kid by talking about the hauto, they immediately know the direction and the intensity because the hoto only affects totara tree above 15 knots because of the stiffness of the foliage. See what I'm saying there? They're planted on the school grounds, so if it's affecting that tree, they know where on the school grounds, so therefore which direction wind we're talking about. Still with me here? So that's ability to read some trees. Also, there's other things that we've done with trees in the past where we plant them in rows so that they point to where the next food sources. It's a whole range of things that we learn from trees and its ability to read which tree means what. I know some of this fellow's relations over there, they'll often walk out the back door to look at trees to determine what the ocean's going to do later on in the day. Don't look at the ocean, look at Zaka and find that out. Insects is another space there we're doing a lot with at the moment. Andrew sent me an uh, email last night and he says, oh, I've been reading about homeotikete. Boy, boy, you're out of control. <laughs> he says to me, I read some really cool things. I said, I know, there's some cool things out there. <coughs> and the fuck about homeo ticket in some areas, and some areas are not even mentioned. And homeo ticket comes down to, in this particular story, um, Rarohe, or Rahu Rahu, which 
which is uh, bracken fern. And from our perspective, working in health promotion, and it's definitely in terms of nutrition, uh, that was the first source of carbohydrate that Māori consumed. And Mark talks about this, and that, that he that was about waterways, must have been a few years ago. Um, I, I had some questions that come out of that one at the time. I'll discuss those in a moment. But down to the rahu rahu. Uh, then down into aruhe, which is the root that comes off that, and that can be crushed, all the sticky bits taken out, you mix it with water and cook them up over rocks. That it tastes terrible, but if you have a pork bones, it's all right. <laughs> oh, no, you like them? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, aruhe, and then under aruhe, we get into monehu, which are the spores that come off that. And from there, we get kaitanga pepeke, which are some insects, and then different types of insects. Now, the email he sent to me was, underneath there, there's a suggestion about mosquitoes and sandflies coming off that one that they hide in there. And I said, oh, I don't know about that. I said, sometimes what I, uh, and that was from, you know, his research around that, that some of the insects that bite and fly, another whakapapa line is through akakamatua. And akakamatua was providing the vines that Fido Te Tipua climbed up to get to Ngā Kete Wānanga while Pāne was climbing up here, or Tāwhaki or Māui, which is the district you're from. And Fido Te Tipua um, asked Fido if he could borrow some of his kids, and those were those animals that flew and drew blood. So mosquitoes and sandflies have a closer whakapapa to that than they do to homia tiki tiki down into here. Now, why I'm telling you this is not to um, mess with your heads about how much whakapapa exists and the multiple directions that we can use for it, but that from a health promotion perspective, there's massive opportunities for us to look at that line and discuss some of the things that come off it. So that one of the first things is that if we're talking about mosquitoes and sandflies, there's a system of understanding the process of engaging with physical activity that we can take from both of those. I learnt this while I was riding my bike from Taranga to Waihopai. So I rode my bike down to Bluff and I noticed different environmental changes every day. It was a 3,000k ride, 100k a day, and I put up three minutes of environmental science every day. And one of the things I noticed about these mosquitoes was that they were bloody relentless and they wouldn't let me sleep one night. And I was thinking, okay, so they're motivating me to keep moving. One of the things I learned about that was that when it comes to working with humans in the space of physical activity, I'm better off only having one or two if I do that at night, and we do that quietly. If I want to run big group sessions, I'll do that during the day and under the guise of Namugiria, who's the sandfly process. Because of his success during the day of attacking and losing a few, we can be as loud as we want, and I might lose a few out of the crew, but if I'm training, other people for specific roles, I'll do that at night or early in the morning, in darkness and quietly. So I learned the process of how to work with athletes based on an environmental process that comes from mosquitoes and sandflies. You still with me? I know it's getting out there. It's one of the roles I can take off home here if I choose to acknowledge which insects might come under there. Because I can stop a teitanga pepek and shoot out to the side. Or the other thing I did was I followed that one further down and I went to Rotane, who's the other or uh, uh, stick insect. And so I wrote three CrossFit programs based on the torsional strength of rotane when you hang his front two legs off your hand because he doesn't bend. So then I looked at all the different ways that rotane is affected by wind. And then I had groups come together and when they were doing prone holds, they had to change the prone hold to figure out what the dominant wind it was outside and then they had to move across this way for their prone hold. And then I changed which foot and which leg that we had to do at which time. Then they had to move across the floor and the arm had to shake in the movement of raw tāne. So then a prone hold wasn't a prone hold, it was about mātranga Māori through homia tikitike down to raw tāne that ended up being an expression of a strength conditioning program for people. See what I'm saying? People come last. Now the third part about the homia tikitike coming down through there is that when we look at ngā pakanga atu or ngā uh, the battles between Atua. First one over whether the wahinga or the separation of Rangi and Papa should happen. I'm talking fast now because I'm going to run out of time. The second one was about the idea of uh, who should get Ngā Kete Wānanga. The third one over here was about uh, one of the Atua going back and punishing the rest because of their lack of courage in the face of Tāwhiri Mātua. Now one of the ways he did that was to attack his relations and eat their children. And this is where Mark has a different view on this one. I was interested when he talked about his because there's a, a bigger issue that will come out of this one for nutritionists is that when that happened, 
That's the origin of nutrition for Māori because that was the first time we ate. You see what I'm saying here? Oh. Okay, so the whakapapa, we've got those three battles. The last battle, Tumatoinga, who's our atua of humans and warfare, punished all of his relations because they didn't stand up to Tafiri over here. The way he did that was to eat the children of those atua, which are representatives of different environments, such as Rongo Marairua for Kumara, Homia Tikitiki for Aruhe, and he ate their children, which happened to be Kumara, or happened to be Aruhe, or happened to be Kaimwana under Tangaroa. Now, the question that I have for you, and the part that I show at nutritionists is, therefore, is eating because of revenge, or is it because of harvest? Mark went with the harvest, I went with the revenge. Now, if revenge is the driver for why we eat, what's that going to cause in the way we eat? Come on, miss, don't fall asleep, this is gold. <laughs> Wake her up, but give me a listen. You know what's worse when you're on a bloody presentation or you're lecturers talking and you fall asleep and then you wake up and you throw your books and shit out on the front of it. <laughs> oh, that one's hard to explain. <laughs> so, uh, you can see the rationale and the way my head's thinking about this and how it gets to those points. Now, the last part there with risk assessment is that if we can read those insects, we can read those trees, we can read all those different tohu, then we get to, I don't want to use risk assessment or aromata way to do as risk assessment, but what it means is that we understand whakapapa at the highest level because then we know whether we should go or not, or we know which things are going to be more effective or not. And we know which things are going to motivate people to engage with plastics pollution or not. And often uh, when we stay human-centered from an indigenous people's perspective, it doesn't work for us, <laughs> rightly or wrongly. Oh, the other thing about this one here, uh, this is recently I went for a bike ride around Lake Hawe, and what I did was I looked at a map from 1830 that a Māori followed down there, drew for one of the ethnographers to show where Lake Hawe was and all of the different locations around. And about three weeks ago, I went down there, entered this race down there so I could get access to the land that was behind there because it's private property on a sheep station. Rode my bike around to there, buggered off, went for a look on the hills <laughs> to try and find some of the sites that were on this map. 1830 this was, so I found all these different sites, rode my bike around, put videos up, stuck it on Facebook, and it was to show some of the things from the past and what they look like now. Bloody near broke me in a half. It was 160 k's in one shot. And it was all mountain biking, but it was a cool day because I got to see some of the, some of the visions and the ways of looking at Tayo that uh, those fellows from down there would have seen. And so that's pretty unique to be able to do that. Another place to come across this is in the Whangani, uh, up the river. Some of you have been up the river. You know those holes that are inside the mud cliffs where they've stuck the sticks in to pull the boats up? You can literally put your hand in where you know Māori ancestral connections are. If you're from that river, you can touch where you know they were definitely there. That's bloody unique. You know, you, 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 so few places you can do that in New Zealand. And so when you put that forward as a, a rationale, a reason for why you would go, that has to be embedded in that connection to Mātauranga Māori, to the knowledge of that not to the physical activity, and then you'll see them pursue that hard. Y'all are still okay? What time do you want me to wrap up? Another five minutes? Or is it questions? Another five minutes? I love this topic. I'll talk you to bloody death about this <laughs> because it's payo and I love being outside. The only drawback is someone's going to find out and I'll get sacked soon because I have the time of my life out here. I go biking, I go paddling. Uh, we swim out to different places. Uh, I get the I got the coolest job you've ever seen. Uh, it's tough sometimes physically and mentally, but hell, uh, I couldn't think of anything better to do. So, as uh, some of the things we're developing at the moment, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality Google Earth virtual tours, which allow people to go on visits to places of importance that can show which Atua were there. What types of physical activity and nutrition could be obtained from there and what can be obtained now? So I've been teaching this into schools in South Auckland, for example, four schools there funded by Cure Kids to teach them about how to build Google Earth virtual tours. I'm not that interested in the tour, but I'm interested in the delivery of Mātauranga Māori and what it leads to. And the platform of that tech is something that kids are into. 
We've been building quite a few of these lately. Um, and it's a cool format to use. We use 360 cameras as well. And what we do with that is we'll put a 360 camera under drone, put it up. Then from there with 360 footage, you can scroll on the screen to go and visit whichever location you want. Which means that we can have one narrator, drone, 360 camera, 10 sites, even on school grounds, and they can scroll over to here, then come back to the narrator. Scroll over to there, then come back to here. And it lets us convey a heap of information really quickly, as tight as they want, and they build it themselves. So we teach them about how to deliver on a Māori, but they get the incidental gain of health change because of it. Fight. I'm going as fast as I bloody can. <laughs> um, hey, this is in the hall in Uawa. That's my daughter in the middle doing something completely different. <laughs> She's 15 now. Uh, and she went to the, uh, to the district school there in Tolaga. She misses it there too. I actually think she thinks she's from there. I said, you're a bloody eel from Hamilton. One of the things we're doing at the moment is looking at, uh, I'm on the board for the local school where I'm at, and they want me to build a fitness trainer. I said, fundamentally, I disagree with it. So you would think I would agree with it. I, I agree, disagree sometimes with gyms as well. Because often they're concrete rooms with discs of steel, and you lift that up and down on the pursuit of health. I'm not sure. So I asked my tupuna whether we would do that. They would look at me like, mm -hmm. But I see heaps of other benefits around whanaunga tanga, around injury, recovery, and gyms are great for that and for meeting up with mates. In this space here, the fitness trail, what I've suggested and we're going to build there is we're getting stock footage on 360 cameras. We put that in an area where it's stored for our students to then go in, pull out pieces of stock footage from the school grounds 14 different sites, and we give them the option of three modalities of fitness where there's equipment that's lying on the ground that might be rocks and logs and so on, and they can build something with it. Stationary equipment that's for lifting, for cycling, for pre bench press, whatever. And then the third version, that's material that's uh, they're able to climb through the static structures and they can create any kind of interaction with it. They then go back to the stock footage and they build their own fitness trails. They share them between classes and they can change them every few weeks. See what I'm saying? That Google Earth lets us do this. We can shift and build our own tour of a virtual uh, fitness trail before they go and do it and then they share it with other schools globally. And we can drag in other schools from a whole range of places. And it gives us more flexibility with how we do this. Am I doing it all right, Mohan? I'm going to get lunch. Man, you fellas are tough. You've got to work hard to get lunch here. <laughs> the other one that we've been uh, connecting up to is Urupa. I don't know about whether some fellas will agree with this, uh, but it was your bloody relation that started this one. Uh, when Paratene passed, he had um, a webcam to come and film his tanga. And the webcam was too pāpaku live. It was a play on words. Uh, but he had a webcam. Half the people hated it, from what I can understand, and half loved it because they couldn't get there, but it went to Australia and all over the globe. We're looking at similar things with um, VR tours of Urupa in terms of eponymous ancestors for why you're named like that, what things they did in order for that tribe to change. So it allows us to track why things happened all the way through. And part of the other module or approach we're using for that is systems dynamics. Whakapapa is identical to systems dynamics, actually. It's the same thing. And with systems, it lets us trace back to why a particular line is more successful or not. It's used to track the spread of disease, for example. But we're looking at why a particular iwi has been successful in sustaining their whakapapa. All good? I had some other videos and things to show you, but we run out of time. Oh, playing fields is the other area we've been having a look at. This is one of the consequences of not being very good at sport. <laughs> if you're interested, I can send you some of the slides. I've got some Google Earth virtual tours on there that um, if, you, if the room's free and you want to hang around for five minutes, I'll show them to you. You can get copies of them as well. But we need to wrap it up. Those that need to go can. If you want to hang around, I'll show you some virtual tours and how they're built. Fight. Whenita mihi 
o kau te mana ki tanga ki te nei o nga tino kau papa te faka tai ngo tia tiki ki nga mo hio tanga ma tanga nga nga ma arma tanga o nga tsa nga kai tia kimi nga tsipua tena ko te tena ko te kiri mata thank you very much. We have a few minutes, so does anyone have a pressing question that I'd quite like to ask? I have a microphone, don't leave me hanging. I don't need a microphone. Oh, you do, for the camera. Everyone at home is watching. Yeah. Okay, um, Terio Hanson from Centre for Defence and Security Studies. Um, I know we sort of apply this sort of environmental approach when it comes to, to other non-human species, animals and the like. Um, what are your, the biggest obstacles when you're trying to bring it into human health for um, taking on board what we already are to do to other creatures? Um, what's, what, what's the biggest obstacle to... Uh, people, yeah. Anthropocentric arrogance, I think it's called, where people think that they're the most important thing on the planet. Which is ironic, really, when you s see that a mountain or a river has a million years worth of knowledge about how to survive and keep flowing, and then for 60 years you think you're better. I, I, I struggle with that part. Māori didn't practice this way that we're trying to pursue health at the moment, where it's human-centred in the past, environmentally based, and then shifted into a mainstream model, and then we're trying to shift out of that. So that's probably one of the big ones there, is that people get in the road of that most. The second part is that when we talk about Atua or environmental connection, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Health are really uncomfortable because when we talk about Atua, they think we're talking about religion. We're not. Post wehing or separation of Papatu uh, Nuku from Rangi is environmental science entirely. There's no religious connotation connected to it at all. And we're talking about environmental science. So we have to tell them the difference between Te Atua, which is uh, the Mihinara, the missionary's idea of God, to Nga Atua, which is environmental science is a big shift again for people to get their heads around. Uh, probably uh, in the past when I've given talks like this, I'll get, I don't know, 30% of the room that don't like it because it questions their religious beliefs. I'm not talking about creationism. I'm talking about environmental science. Um, probably the other area too is that uh, some of my colleagues think this is tapu information. It's not for public dissemination. Creationism probably. This stuff definitely for public suggestion for people to see. We have to ask ourselves what's the intent of knowledge? Why learn? What for? Multiple answers to that as you know, but for us, maybe it's because we want to make Papa Papa survive. Therefore, stories about us are critical. Does that help? I don't know the answers to that, to be blunt. Thank you very much. That was uh, enlightening. Thank you, Kiora. A specific question with regard to your comment that um, research is going to shift from Kaupapa Māori to iwi-centred research. Would you care to comment on the idea that with the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which is a global yep. international oh, framework, and we're all going to be measured by the same standards, uh -huh. how does that sit with a shift to local EV-based research? We can still engage with that, although I suspect the order of those concepts for which things we need to be paying attention to for global sustainability are out of order for most indigenous people because of the number of those that suggest that humans should be the primary driver behind why that should, should occur. So I'm, I'm not sure about that part of how we're going to coordinate some resistance to that or whether we become part of that process or not. Uh, secondly, when it comes to kaupapa Māori concepts, they've been here for quite a while. Maybe the suggestion that you have to change is a bit harsh. <coughs> but you don't. I'm from Waikato. Why would you listen to me? don't have to do anything, I suggest. Uh, and I see my world through the space of, or the, the glasses of someone that looks at rivers. And we'll flow on, we'll carry on. People will stand in the middle, we'll go over them or around them, but we're heading that way. And whether other people want to come with us or not, that's up to them. But the suggestions I'm trying to pass on to people is that uh, we offer an alternative way of knowing to 
is that of mainstream science, perhaps. It's one that sustained the whakapapa of indigenous people for millennia, 100,000 years in one space for Aboriginal people, 50,000 minimum, suggests they're pretty successful at reading their environment. So I think we have to look at alternative ways. And it's interesting to me that uh, not long after that document that came out for the Lancet Commission, that there was a lot of global interest in Māori ways of producing outcomes that aren't people-centred. Straight after that, two days later, I got a request to do a um, podcast with a group from London that were engaged with new approaches to health because of their failures and looking for alternative ways of knowing. But it's humbling for these fellows to ring and ask to do this podcast, but it's a fair indication that we're not being successful globally in other ways. And if there's a connection to addressing climate change, potentially, to addressing uh, how we engage with education, to addressing health outcomes through a model that looks environmentally centred first, that's solving quite a few problems all at once, or attempting to. I hear where you're coming from. Don't listen to me. I'm mad as a snake. <laughs> It's not a question, but it's just a total for um, he and um, a topical issue is mental health. And when we look at the global movement for mental health, we're following a measure that's the Diagnostic Statistical Manual or the ICD. And what we know is that that measure is not working for anyone, in particular indigenous peoples of the world. And as we all know that we want to move from a biomedical to a contextual model, that has to be relevant to you and what you value. And just to be a little bit, um, I don't know, antagonistic, when you look at the research, it shows that those people who avoid the mental health systems, they actually do better. When you avoid that measurement, that global measurement, um, psychiatry was, they followed a biomedical model a long time ago, and it was really important. But we actually know there's a lot of scientism. There's no reliability. There's no uh, validity, and it's not working for Māori. Yet, when we use something very similar in, with a Māori psychology without a clinical lens, and you go back to whakapapa, and, and you go back to mātauranga Māori, and you, do, you go back to relationships, almost 100% of people that walk into a psychiatrist's room have relational issues. And if it's not relationship with other, it's relationship with self and what the hell that means in the context of their environment. So when you're looking at global movements, we have to actually challenge what we're pushing. And I totally agree, neoliberalism has a lot to do with the problems we have, particularly at a competitive level. We have to collab, we have to be together, we have to be collective, but these institutions don't support that. So these types of institutions that involve actually um, passionate individuals that don't get paid as much as uh, our meritocratic uh, structure, they are doing the phenomenal work, but what you'll find is that the government and the ministries are not binding to it. And that's because you have the same people thinking the same way, hoping to get different outcomes. Better not be a hard question. I already apologise for teasing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you visualise an environmentally centred module of teaching would look like? Like, how can how can we put that perspective and have people think about the environment first before that? Like, what is your vision of how to teach that? Oh, it's a difficult one, no doubt. Uh, Ministry of Education through one of these fellows' relations, which is Paratini's younger brother, Wayne Up, is working second in line to DepSec at the Ministry of Ed. Uh, they want to provide Atua based information onto an e platform so that it can go out to all schools and help educate teachers alongside students. And that's about to start. So, in the next two months, you'll get the first two uh, e versions of Atua being delivered. Uh, 
that's one of the efforts that we're going to undertake. I suspect that we probably need to get to teachers' colleges as well and talk with teachers' colleges about how we might infuse more information that's environmentally centred. Because what it allows us to do is to, when we get to the metaphor phase, mātaranga Māori, whakapapa, huahua tau, huahua tau lets you interpret how you want. You can go off and teach whichever topic you like from there. So part of what we're doing there is we're testing how we can deliver environmentally centred information into other curriculum topics outside science that's connected to the environment. So we can teach geography, we can teach um, maths, we can teach different languages, we can teach a whole range of things. Just take some creativity. And probably the hardest role in that is uh, with current teachers adjusting to a flat leadership structure where they learn alongside the students. And at the moment, they don't like that. But you're coming through that. You're it. Can hand away. Uh, maybe last question. Oh, kia ora. Yeah, um, so my brain's on fire now, <laughs> in, in a good way. So thank you for that. But um, I just, I was really interested to hear your comment about um, the different. Inter I'm sort of thinking about symbolic ecology and the different ways that you can interpret um, Whaka Papa. Uh, and you were talking before about the difference between interpretation of consumption of various foods through whakapapa and how Mark interpreted it quite differently as revenge and you interpret it in a different way. How much does that matter? Does it matter how you interpret it? it does it depend on who interprets it and how meaningful that is for those who are doing the interpretation? Uh, I don't think it does matter. Um, because if we're at that phase around hu of taking a metaphor, a sign, an indicator, it's up to the creativity of the deliverer about how they then move into the next platform to produce something further out. They actually ask it. Um, I had a discussion yesterday uh, about the idea that at the moment I've worked with a lot of Māori health organisations that are looking at capacity development, which I get. Yeah, now me, we need to do that. But we need to shift into the next phase as well, which is dynamic capability, which means that you take this information and you figure out how to apply it in other areas. If you don't get to this space here, this is worthless. And this is all we're doing is we're capacity development, but not telling them what to use it for or how to use it. So the process matters, not the content. Then once they understand the process, there's multiple potential outputs for how we do that. If it happens to come through revenge or harvest, it's not a essential information for them, but they can build something from that and probably the more difficult part is harvest is easier to market and sell to different fellows than revenge. <laughs> I'm eating because I'm punishing you versus I'm eating because I'm gathering. The different kinds of structures. Sometimes, though, if we follow that whakapapa line further down, there's some other explanations <coughs> that are really cool around that. But there's practical levels as well. And that's upper level philosophy that comes through Atu about why they may have eaten. But as we get further down, uh, the Harota Waka talk about their journey across from maybe the cooks or from latterly or further out from Tahiti and on the way running out of food, stopping, getting Aruhe and Kumara from the island that they pass and then carrying on and the Waka doing this. Now that's a metaphor. It doesn't mean literally that the Waka was sailing badly. It meant that they stored two different qualities of food in the Waka after they left the island. One was Aruhe, one was Kumara. It's a metaphor that your body is the waka, if you store different types of food, types that are not likely to want to be stored together because of their quality, then your waka will have trouble staying. And even if we come further down, the implements we used to use have changed. We had a, a fork that was a version with one prong. You can't shovel with one of those. Practical information that comes from Atua explanation all the way through. But it depends how you want to interpret that and what it might mean to you. And at the moment, I see people aren't ready or don't feel licensed to make those interpretations. And certainly I see it in my park and colleagues that say, that's mean stuff. I love what you do. Firstly, I'll never remember it because it's too much. Even my Māori may say, bro, you blow my head out every time I talk to you. It's meant to be a five-minute conversation and it's a 20-minute bloody rant. So well, don't ask questions then. <laughs> but if we're going to go into that space, uh, we need Pākehā to be on this journey with us. Absolutely. My mates disagree with me hard on this one. But the reason that we need Pākehā involved with it is because 
you fellas are the conduit to other Pākehā that we can't reach. Your mates, you're the ones that are going to shift them, not us. I might get to a couple of people, but you'll get to all of your mates, and you'll be the ones that will shift them because they think I've got a vested interest, which I have. But you may not, and you seem to be more objective, so you'll shift them. So you're critical, as I said. Without you, we're buggered. Cool, eh? And bad, too. You're like, ah. <laughs> One final question. Tēnā koe, kia ora tato. I don't actually have a question. It's just really more of a comment, if that's all right. Um, Kiri ta i tako ingoa no wanganui au, no te awa wanganui. I feel reassured. I think that's what I wanted to say, was that what you're saying for the ma'i that we do at home with our rangata'i is right. We're taking them back to our awatupua. We're getting them to put their hands in those holes that you talk about, to come down i amarai, i amarai, tui rongo i te marai, e kai kōrero, kai karanga, me era mea. And, you know, those are the solutions that we have to go back to our atua. I see at the back there my colleague on the Mental Health Foundation. It's interesting because we, a challenge, I guess, for those types of organisations who do receive a lot of um, a grant and, and sponsorship and support, that we need to think about whether or not we're sponsoring the right things. Because ane te rongoa mo tato. That's all I needed to say. And of course, we came from ACC, so we've got, we've got billions of dollars that we're putting Bruce. in the wrong place. Anyway, I don't need this microphone. Well, the best thing out. about this question was whenever, uh, whenever I see anybody turn up in the room and they got moko um, kanuhi or moko kaua and they ask questions, I think, oh, I'm going to get slaughtered. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad to not be slaughtered. Thank you. Bye bye. Kia ora. <laughs>